Um, okay, so this is our fourth session, and I am super excited to have with us Dr. LaQuandra Nesbitt. She's the immediate past um, <clears throat> director of DC Health and is the current executive director of the Center for Population Health Sciences and Health Equity at GW in the School of Medicine. And um, I'm going to make you a co-host so that you should be able to share your screen too. So Dr. Nesbitt, it is all you. Um, and when you're when you're done, we'll take questions and then um, folks will have any other additional time to go to their breakout groups. Let me know if you have any issues sharing your screen. Great. Good morning. Now, it looks like I should be able to share without any problem. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here with you all this morning. Uh, as um, was mentioned, I'm Dr. LaQuandra Vesman. I'm the Senior Associate Dean for Population Health. Uh, and health equity at GW, um, and also am a professor of medicine and health sciences at GW, uh, and have um, over 15 plus years of governmental uh, public health experience. Um, uh, most of that time uh, has been here in Washington, uh, D.C., which I understand is where most of you uh, are um, in leadership positions uh, in our um, cancer centers. Um, interestingly, or very early in my career, um, I did some work with the South Atlantic Division of the American Cancer Society. Uh, and uh, very early in my career, uh, during my time as an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, I did work in uh, cancer health disparities, um, doing community-based participatory research uh, with cancer navigation projects uh, funded by NCI. So um, have some uh, familiarity with uh, NCI designated uh, cancer centers um, and the work that you all um, do. I see no faces, um, so I unfortunately have no idea um, about any of you all's reactions to uh, any of the work I will be presenting. So this will be very awkward. Um, to do over Zoom. So I will assume uh, some degree of interest in the topic um, that we'll be talking about today, uh, which is communicating equity to stakeholders and inclusive governance. Uh, I um, will start the discussion in terms of talking about uh, organizational and institutional structures um, around governance in terms of how uh, many um, traditional organizations are structured in terms of uh, executive leadership, governing boards, um, and in particular around uh, cancer centers often have advisory committees. And then talking about how those types of structures um, can facilitate um, can facilitate uh, advancing uh, DEI and particularly what the what as it relates to health focus organizations should be um, embedding concepts and principles of DEI for the purposes of advancing health equity. Uh, and then we'll try as best as we can to be practical and illustrative because I understand as you all move throughout your time together today, we'll be in breakout sessions where you'll have the time to do some work together as a group uh, to uh, sort of think about how you operationalize and put this work into practice in your uh, respective organization. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. I will um, share my screen and um, I think if someone can just confirm for me that you're seeing um, this presentation in we do. We see mode, it. and we've now advanced to the first slide, which just shows uh, governance. Uh, and then the, what I view is the sort of three um, things that we'll move through, which is talking about structure, accountability, and how to communicate intention and delivering results. Fantastic. All right. So um, first, we'll talk about structure and why structure matters uh, in terms of um, helping to facilitate uh, um, anything, really, essentially, uh, when you're trying to move something forward in an organization. Uh, the structure of an organization helps to create the infrastructure for, go for governance. Uh, I know that some of you may find yourself, when you, when you take a role 
uh, whether it's a paid role, a volunteer role, you may often ask yourself, like, what in the, who's in charge of this place? Um, who makes the decisions around here? And so infrastructure and structure matters, and it's extremely important when we uh, have conversations in terms of governance. Uh, governance uh, and the structure helps to serve the, as the foundation for decision making, uh, whether that decision making is more dictatorial or hierarchical, or whether or not it's shared amongst the group of individuals. Uh, if there are checks and balances in place in terms of the decision making, uh, that foundation is often set by the structure. And then the voices represent, represented within the governance structure may be the only voices of influence. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Sometimes there are democratized organizations or democratized environments uh, where the um, voices of influence can come from a host of places or there can be, uh, if you think about organizations that use town hall formats for employees to share their, uh, share to provide their input or offer solutions, um, you may get additional influence. Uh, outside of what's considered the governance structure, but that may not always be the case. Uh, it's important to understand the structure um, and how governance is designed in order to really be able to navigate these systems uh, and to understand where power and influence rest uh, within these systems and to be able to effectively bring about change. Uh, and that's critically important when you're talking about advancing diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion uh, within organizations, uh, and particularly where we're talking about influencing health of, of individuals and health of community. And, and we can recognize, which I believe you all have done that effectively, which is how we've come to this discussion today, that you can embed the concepts and principles, including embedding people um, into, these, into these structures in order to advance diversity and inclusion. Uh, within the governance structure. Uh, and that's why I think it's important for us to have a conversation about structure today. Um, we recognize often that structure includes these three, again, uh, three different domains, executive and internal leadership. When I say executive leadership, I'm often talking about CEOs, presidents, uh, executive directors um, of organizations, or what we often think of as the C-suite um, you can, depending on how the size and the, the size and the scope of an organization, often think of middle management as being part of the internal leadership structure. Uh, many organizations will have a governing board. Uh, these may be individuals who are external to the organization. They are not part of who runs the day-to-day -day operations um, of the organization, um, are people who often hold jobs and responsibilities elsewhere. Uh, but help to make decisions about the strategic plan for the organization, evaluate um, the performance of the senior executives, uh, set budget priorities, and um, help to drive the mission and vision of the organization. And then you may have advisory boards who uh, don't have the authority to set mission, vision, uh, budgetary priorities, are not responsible for the evaluation and performance of the paid staff, but do weigh in on the strategic priorities, are sought as strategic thought leaders to help influence program design, may often be comprised of uh, those who receive services from the organization or are partners in delivering services to the organization um, and help to ensure that the organization um, is always aligned with the needs um, of the clients. Uh, so these are often part of like a tripartite uh, governance um, structure uh, for many organizations. Now you may find that in the public, in the private sector, or in academic institutions, um, you may not have all three components in this governance structure. Um, in the public sector, you often don't have a governing board. The governing board may be the legislative branch. Uh, as opposed to um, a, gov a governing board that's um, appointed uh, from some other entity, they're often elected, uh, but these they, three things often exist in, in, in some form. Uh, any questions about this structure before we get into it a little bit more deeply? Does this resonate with you all showing thumbs up um, in terms of being reflective of the types of structure that exists for uh, the operations of your cancer centers and the health systems in which you work? Are you all familiar with this type of type of 
governance structure? Yes. Great, fantastic. Um, so when we think about DEI concepts and principles um, and opportunities for advancing uh, DEI uh, within this governance structure, um, there's real potential for diversity diversity of leadership, DEI concepts, um, and really thinking about this in every level, every role. Um, what we've seen recently is that, uh, especially in health systems, um, and when I say health systems, healthcare delivery organizations, health plans, um, public health organizations, we're starting to see this chief health equity officer or um, DEI officer, and it sits in one of two places. Uh, you may have a DEI officer that sits in the human resources space that's responsible for uh, promoting a diverse workforce or helping to infuse uh, concepts of equity throughout the organization or helping to support an inclusive environment, or you may have a chief health equity officer that's helping to ensure that the programs and services that are developed within that health focused organization are helping to achieve equitable outcomes. Sometimes that role occurs and the responsibility, authority, and resources for that position are not as robust as the other uh, positions that are at the same level in the C-suite. Um, the other thing that may happen is that the DEI officer or the chief health equity officer may be the only person who is from a um, minoritized population uh, or representative of an underrepresented group within the C-suite. So they may be the only person who comes from a racially minoritized group. They may be the only person in the C-suite who self-identifies as being a member of a gender uh, minority population or self-identifies as being LGBTQ+, or has a, um, a physical, intellectual, um, or developmental disability, right? And those organizations are likely failing to realize that people from those populations are equally qualified to be the president or CEO of the company or equally <laughs> qualified to be the chief financial officer of that company. So there are really opportunities to have diversity of leadership in every level, every role of the company. And um, you can create opportunities for leadership everywhere uh, and not just restrict those opportunities to members of um, typically minority, minoritized populations just for the DEI and chief uh, health equity officer. Uh, so those are important things to remember. The way that you can cultivate opportunities for diversity and leadership in those roles is really through workforce and professional development strategies internally, um, and also through community talent acquisition strategies and pipeline programs. And what I mean by that is how you partner with your community partners and academic organizations, your um, K through 12 uh, institutions, your community colleges, your universities, which I know many of you have affiliations with universities, to create internships um, and pipeline programs so that you are constantly cultivating new talents that come into your organization um, to work. And working with minority serving institutions uh, can help you create a constant pipeline of talent into your organization, creating opportunities for um, a diverse workforce. Uh, in terms of governing boards, uh, one of the things that often happens with governing boards is that uh, the organizations are looking for members of their governing boards who can help uh, with the financial mission <laughs> of the organization. Um, so many members come to the governing board to serve two purposes. One, they have a background intellectually in the mission of the organization. So they're looking to recruit people who can fit certain needs that the organization has that is not necessarily reflected in their workforce, um, but are skills that they have. So let's say they're going to embark upon a big IT project. They may go out and, and recruit a member for the board who has a huge background in technology and can help fill a gap that their staff doesn't have. Or if it's a health-focused organization, they may reserve a certain number of seats on their governing board for people who have a background in health and healthcare. 
Um, and the governing boards, members of the governing boards oftentimes have a fundraising responsibility. So they're often looking for well-resourced and well-networked members to serve on the board. Uh, there, for some reason, people believe that this may not be aligned with the values to advance DEI goals. Um, but there are member, many people who are aligned with DEI values who can also fit into those other um, characteristics or other skill sets that they are trying to meet. So how do you specifically find and identify governing board members who are aligned with the values to advance health equity and cancer care? Um, how do you make sure that you are able to, um, to help meet some of those goals? I often hear uh, people talk about, oh, we're looking for grateful patients to help uh, meet these goals. And I think many of you can recognize that when people think about the types of people who can serve on boards or the type of donors who can be, uh, who can give back after having a cancer di diagnosis, these often look like rich white families, right? Well, there are plenty of people who have an experience with cancer who can serve on not the advisory board, the actual governing board for many of these entities that have the direct input into how financial resources are gonna be invested and how what, what who the next CEO may be for the organization, um, who are, again, aligned with the DEI values. Uh, and this governing board should really represent and reflect those served in order to avoid you know, both paternalism, patriarchy, being patronizing. And it's important to recognize that these are not values that are restricted to white men. Um, white women uh, can also carry these same case characteristics. Um, we also have to recognize that when we're thinking about members of governing boards, that we have to be as diverse on the governing board as we often are with the advisory board, which typically holds less power uh, in terms of the organization. And then being mindful to recruit from external networks. We often look to the governing board to recommend additional people to be on the governing board when their terms end. But we all have read and know of many studies where things like asking employees to refer new employees doesn't really change the composition and diversity um, of our organization. And then lastly, when we talk about the structure for advisory boards and committees, um, it's important to think about diversity from uh, in terms of membership to bring about diversity of perspective. Um, when we talk about the continuum of care and diagnosis, I see this often with advisory boards for specific health conditions, um, and in particular cancer. When we talk about the continuum of care, looking at prevention, treatment, and survivorship, we often look to people who are in the survivorship space to advise on prevention. Well, we know that the experience of cancer often has us, and I, again, say this as someone not only who's done work in cancer, but who has lost two grandmothers to cancer and who has a mom who is currently still in oral chemotherapy for a diagnosis of breast cancer in 2018. But you know, when you ask people about what prevention strategies who should be in place, who's had a diagnosis or experience with cancer, they think very differently about it than the population who's never had an experience with cancer, right? So what I would have done earlier around my screening for lung cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, um, and hep hepatitis screening for liver cancer is very different if I've never had an experience with those things, then what I will tell you I would have done once I've had a diagnosis, right? So we need to be very thoughtful about what the advisory board composition should be for prevention, treatment, and survivorship and who we bring to the table for that. Um, the same thing around the continuum of the health ecosystem in terms of health engagement, community engagement, health education, research partnerships, clinical care, the lived experience, Recognizing for the life course, we need to be sensitive in terms of how we engage youth um, because of their ability to consent for participation in these types of advisory boards, but their voices and their perspectives are extremely valuable. And then the diversity of, in terms of demographic factors, because again, the social economic things that ex people with cancer experience are highly variable based on their resources and ability to effectively engage 
um, in, in prevention and treatment services. And then we also understand again about the risk of um, the risk of uh, recurrence that is connected with stress um, and how that affects five-year survival rates. So any questions around the advisory, the structure piece um, before we sort of move into um, how we think about accountability and assessment or any reactions um, to this piece or did we just waste time talking about things that are extremely obvious to you? Mandy? Oh, Candy? Um sorry uh so when you were talking about like kind of the way that most of these or many of these um uh like diversity positions are structured and like the lack of power that the people that are put in those positions have and kind of the hollowness of the titles often to be able to make significant change i'm wondering if you have thoughts on like how those setups can be shifted. Because I think like, you know, lots of people will say, yeah, you know, it sounds great, but they really don't generally have power. Or oftentimes the women, the black women usually who are set up in these positions aren't given the tools or the, you know, external structure to be able to make change. How do we change that if the people who set up the systems maybe don't see the, necess the necessity to have significant change. Yeah, it's an extremely difficult um, difficult system to navigate, especially at this point, right? And um, there's some new thought pieces being written around this particular concept. Uh, and one of them that was written recently, I'll try to get it to Mandy to send to you all, is sort of a retrospective piece looking at the rise and fall of the number of um, equity officer positions that were created uh, since the murder of George Floyd until now. Uh, so there were a lot of um, corporations that created the positions immediately following the murder of George Floyd uh, and the increase in racial tensions in the US uh, in 2020, and they've already begun eliminating the roles. And yeah, already, we're only in 2023. So within a short three year span, those positions have already begun to be eliminated. Um, and part of that is because um, people were very enthusiastic about accepting the roles uh, because it was the first time that many of those organizations were even demonstrating an interest, um, albeit many of those interests were not well-defined in addressing equity within their organizations. And they were often recruiting people who were well accomplished in their fields um, and were doing poor work in their fields where they would advocate for equitable approaches to the work, right? So let's say that you were doing cancer, this cancer work focused in breast cancer, colorectal cancer, and you would talk about advances in breast cancer and you would always bring an equity or disparities lens to the work, right? But you weren't like, you weren't an equity person who then dipped into breast cancer, dipped into colorectal. You, do you get what I'm saying? It's like distinguishing the differences. And so they would bring you to the organization and they say, we need an equity person. And you say, okay, well, what are your thoughts about, oh, we look to you to do that. We look to you to do that. We look to you to do that. And then you get in the organization and you would have no staff, you'd have no resources. And they would basically, you're almost like a consultant to the entire enterprise, but you have no staff, you have no resources. And then your task then becomes, okay, well, in order to be effective, if my job is to establish metrics, if my job is for us to be able to effectively demonstrate change, to see if we have differential outcomes in XYZ area, we need to approach the work from these different ways. Those organizations weren't necessarily ready or positioned or ready to resource the roles in that way. And so you saw some of the people either, either living on their own or the organization simply not being ready to advance the work in that type of way. So the position either went away because the person left or the position went away because of budget constraints, et cetera. 
Um, so it's a little bit challenging for one, if you are a person who is interested, um, which oftentimes is a, a woman of color, uh, you're interested in advancing equity, it becomes extremely attractive to you to finally be able to go to this Fortune 500, Fortune 100 organization. You've got this great compensation package. You're going to change the world. You're going to end racism. You're going to do all of these great things. And then you're sitting in a role for one, two, three years, and it's probably the least effective opportunity you've ever had in your entire career, right? And you're in this organization and you're realizing that they don't even collect race and ethnicity data. They don't even collect data on gender identity. They don't even collect data on sexual orientation, right? And you're trying to move this entire system and put these things in place and you don't have the resources to do it. Um, so now the onus has become on some of us who know people in these roles who are sitting outside to write as many thought pieces as we possibly can about what structures need to be in place in order for them to be successful, but also to call out that the way that you advance DEI and health equity outcomes in these organizations isn't just to create this position that sits on the margins, but to create an environment where equity is everybody's work, right? Creating an equity-focused institution or organization is to infuse these concepts and principles into the core of the organization, not just to create a position on them. So it's like, yeah, it's, not, it's like, not an either or, it's a both and. You said there was an article that was just describing that trend that you just... Yeah. 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 I would definitely like to see that. And um, it's interesting because I had a, a the opposite experience last week. I was at the American uh, Hospital Association Advancing Health Equity Summit, and it's an event I'd never been to. And it's one of the first times I've walked into a room and I felt like everything you just said and everything we've covered on previous sessions was kind of the starting point. And it was so relieving to see that many people, but that was obviously a unique event, right? Like that's, I don't have that experience in any other part of my day to day. Um, so there's some pretty exciting work being done, but that's really sad to hear about and not actually, I didn't know what you just, what you just described. So um, yeah, I'll, um, I, I'm gonna, I have it. I'll send it to you, um, Mandy, but yeah, it's been a little, been a little frustrating, but we'll get there, right? Like, I think it's it's a signal that one, there was a lot of interest in it, but the one, the positions that do exist, I'll say there's one at Humana where that person has been able to be effective in that she has added more things to her portfolio since starting the role over two years ago. So in addition to being the chief, she still, her title is the chief health equity officer, but she's been able to pull a team of population health people under her portfolio and expand her reach and authority within that organization, right? So it, the way that she's been able to navigate it is to demonstrate her position has even more value to the organization as opposed to less. So it's not, you know, it's not all bad news. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, I think it's really how organizations, it's either they were responding in order to not be on the list of you're not doing anything, and they responded quickly to demonstrate that they were sensitive to, you know, racial tensions, or the ones who were really saying, wow, we really need to act and do better and be advancing concepts and principles of DEI and health equity in our organization. And we don't know what to do yet. We want to hire someone who's going to tell us what to do and then we're going to actually do it versus the ones who were like, we need to do something and we just need to do something, right? So I, I think the, the level of commitment um, from executive leadership, I think is extremely important. But it also, I think Humana also has one of the more diverse governing boards right, which then pushes on the executive leadership to say, we we collectively have a commitment. So how that, who's in that structure really matters. And I think, um, you know, I'd love if other people have questions for Dr. Nesbitt, because I feel like this is a really great opportunity. This, these groups 
um, have a really challenging task in that they may not be executive leadership and they are they are a diversity of different positions, different levels of authority across three different cancer centers and kind of guidance on, you know, um, influencing structures when you may not be at the top of that decision making uh, structure. I I just wonder if folks have some, this is a great opportunity to, to ask any specific questions you might be encountering or might be worried about with the task forces, because I know that your position on the task force is a challenging one, that you're intentionally filling multiple different positions that was by design for the task forces so that you would have different perspectives to bring to the table. But based on what Dr. Nesbitt is sharing, um, I'm going to stop talking and see if there are other questions that can help advance uh, the work of the task forces from you, your all perspective. I guess I kind of wonder like if the the woman who has been so successful at Humana, like if there were like things that she can highlight that were like particularly helpful in her being able to leverage her position and show the organization kind of all that she can bring. And if that has been compared to like the people who've been in positions in other places that did feel very hollow or were not very successful, like if there's been any like discussion on like the differences in the environments or approaches that people may be able to kind of like learn from to data <laughs> we were just <laughs> together a couple weeks ago um and she spent the first few months in her role like she's like I walked in there and was like oh we're just gonna do this real fast why don't you all hand me our data on such and such and they were like what and she's like, oh, okay. So she spent the first few months like pulling together all of this data and then presenting data on how their members, all these differential outcomes for their members in a bunch of different ways. And their organization was like always walking around so peacock proud of like how great they were providing care and services to their members. And when they really started to look at the data, um, and seeing all of these differential outcomes that they had based on geography, based on race, based on a host of different demographic and social factors, they were quite like not, not as proud, right? And so then when she was able to say, these are some different strategies that we need to approach and these are some things that we need to do differently, they couldn't help but to get on board, right? And there's a way that you can talk about these things where people don't want to sweep it under the rug, but they recognize now that they have to be called to the mission. And my organization, as Mandy has mentioned, I'm now at GW. We're going through this process now. And I really just say to them, I said, this part of my organization in the Center for Population Health Sciences and Health Equity is designed to answer the question, are we as good as we think we are? Right? Like, you know, there's all these things where many of your organizations and institutions, they use their name, that's their brand, it's their reputation. And many of the organizations in DC have thrived on their brand. But if you really have to, and, and I, can I can tell you this, having worked in the government for a long time, the community exhausted is exhausted with your brand, right? They're like over your brand. They're like, Stop coming to us thinking we're going to work with you and let you keep coming to us to partner with you because of your brand, right? Or the brand of some famous person who doesn't live here, right? They're like, how cute, right? So they're, they're a little exhausted with that because you've done it for decades. So now you're in the place in order to effectively engage for strategic partnerships, you have to tell them, are you as good as we think you are? As you think, as you, as, are you as good as you think you are? And they want to demonstrate that from a quantitative perspective. Why? Because they have qualitative nightmares, right? Mm -hmm. They can now present to you, well, when my cousin came there, this is how you treated them. And that story told over and over is a nightmare. So in order to be effective when navigating these systems and finding these sources of power and influence, which is why I came back to this slide, 
you all as member of advisories committee, as members of, as employees in these cancer, in these cancer centers, how often do you go to your galas, right? Or how often are you in these different types of social functions that are sponsored? Like y'all all have these fancy things, these fundraisers, and that as staff, you show up to them every now and then. There are members of your governing boards who help to do fundraising or who are donors or whose names are on some mobile mammography something or on a conference room somewhere who are looking for the grateful patient, but they also want to meet the navigators. They also, but there are all of these things that they are funding and they're proud to be affiliated with and associated with. How often do you take the opportunity to have a conversation with them and tell them what it's like to do your work? and how meaningful your work is to you, right? And how there are additional things that you would like to do. Those are opportunities that you can take advantage of for relationship building that gives you power and influence as well, right? So there's where you sit in the organization from a hierarchical perspective, but there's also where you sit in the organization where you have power and influence because you know more about the patient and client experience than they actually do. Does that make sense? So how do you leverage those moments and opportunities where you have for engagement with people who are members of the governing board and people who are in the C-suite where you can actually be influential with the knowledge and information that you have being closest to the patient and client experience, right? So you often delegate most of that power and influence and authority to your advisory board because they're the people with the lived experience, but you have some lived experience too as a person who is providing that direct service and support. Leverage that. Yeah, that's so important. I put this in the chat, but this is exactly why we're going through the organizational assessment questions to figure out what do we even know about our organizations and performance and what we currently do so that we have that as a starting point as to where we should go. So using what we do have for quantitative data, if, you know, if systematic at all, and then the qualitative data we do have to guide what happens next. Um, yeah. Any other questions about structure, navigating structures and systems to understand how to use power and influence? I guess I have one more question, sorry, and then I'll stop talking. Um, I think one of the things that I've kind of like- No, I'm glad into... you're talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I've kind of run into is like when you, well, when I, and maybe it's my, my approach and you can tell me a better approach, but when I start to share like some of the challenges in terms of like the lived experience or the patient's experience that aren't so like glowing and sunshiny and rainbows, um, there's a lot of defensiveness um, in response to it. So it's like there's a wall, right? As soon as a not so flowery experience is shared and then we don't get past the, that wall of like defensiveness to actually get to a point where we can start to make positive change to to so that other people don't have the same negative experiences that maybe I'm sharing from another patient. Yeah, you have to keep doing that. Um, but it, 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 it is indicative of something greater, right? You're giving it to them from a qualitative perspective that allows them to negate it because they view it as the experience. It's like it's an N of one. It's the experience of one person that's an outlier. There has to be some kind of process, like your system needs to have embedded in it some type of process that is more structured, where that N of one becomes, becomes more of the standardized process where you're getting that type of assessment, right? So it, you don't, it sounds like there really isn't a process to more systematically collect and understand the, are we as good as we think we are, right? Now I can tell you, having been on the population health side for the city, your N of one is more, more likely than not the experience of a majority of the people, right? Which is why we yeah. have the poor cancer outcomes that we have, despite us having advances in technology and highly insured population, et cetera, right? So there is some mismatch between the care delivery models, the outcomes we have, the rates of insurance we have, et cetera. 
but the system isn't designed to capture that level and degree of information. So there has to be better processes in place to evaluate care delivery models to better understand why people are falling out of care, why we aren't getting, what is the gap or fully understanding the gap between screening, diagnosis, diagnosis and treatment, treatment and survival. We don't have good enough understanding of what happens in all of those spaces for the various types of cancer to explain why we have such differences between screening and mortality based on race, ethnicity, geography, all of those things. So that that lack of that systematic approach is what allows them to dismiss your, your storytelling and your qualitative narrative, right? So, but you have to keep, keep saying it so that at one point it gets into the right ear where they finally develop a systematic process to collect that information. Can you talk a little bit about how to frame those stories productively? I put this in the chat, but to kind of guide change and positive action. Yeah, so I I kind of shied. I didn't really go deeply into that when I shifted into this next space of accountability and assessment, um, other than say we need to have it. Uh, and although I did um, sort of give some examples around that, um, I didn't frame necessarily those types of uh, those types of measures. Um, I went in a different direction. Um, you know, the the stories and narratives are are important. Um, the qualitative focus groups using mixed methods to evaluate and assess patient and client experience is important. Um, but I, I think we also have some opportunity to understand things quantitatively um, for certain subpopulations, right? And that that data in the whole is not as complete as it should be. But as a first step, I think that there could be some really good focus groups around subpopulations, especially around a few types of cancers, right? Like if we look at breast cancer for Black women, colorectal cancer for Black men um, in particular, the gaps there in screening and more, the gaps there for screening and mortality rates require a lot of expl explanation uh, and some very hyper-focused, hyper-local um, focus groups to get qualitative stories would be extremely important, um, especially around the care journey. So when you look at when you look at breast cancer screening rates, um, they are higher in wards seven in many years than ward three, but mortality rates are higher, right? So in the district, there should be some very clear understanding of the narratives around that. Like what makes it easy for you to get screened, but why do you fall out for diagnostic services and why do you fall out for treatment, right? That leads to higher rates of death and then being able to navigate different care pathways for that. And I think there's something more to it than navigation programs, right? Like, and, and, how, and what is the more that needs to be built out than navigation programs? And th there's something that gets missed when you speak to when you're trying to translate that information to cancer center program directors and community cancer, like the physician side, um, who are developing these programs, who are writing these grants to the cancer, to American Cancer Society and Carmanos and whoever, because they're still recommending the same models for the past 20 years. Like we're gonna go to black churches and have a mammogram ban. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, let me show you this one more time. Like there's this huge, so what is the conversation that's being had with the community to fully understand what is the challenge here? Like, what does the community actually need in terms of support? So I think that there can be a structured um, focus group that gives narrative and voice from the community around that piece. Um, the same thing around um, Black men and colorectal cancer screening, especially given the use of new tools other than colonoscopy um, and understanding what the concerns are around that. I think some of the same methods could be used. And, and, I, I, and I don't know where the, where the 
what the lack of awareness for program design, where that sits. Is it the funder? Is it the medical oncologist? Like who who's the who has the knowledge gap there? Well, I want to give you enough time to get through anything else that um did, that you wanted to get through. I'm not sure if we were at the end of your deck or not. Um and you're not, girl. I had a whole bunch left. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so let's do that. And then teams, if it, it may be that we don't have time to go into breakout groups. So um, so I, I can breeze really quickly through the next things because I essentially I, um, just to kind of talk about how, you know, things that you need to have to be able to like communicate this to stakeholders is there's got to be a part of it that's built in around accountability and assessment. So you really have to set goals and define how you're going to measure those goals. There's a big piece in here that I'm not talking about, which is how you develop and implement programs and initiatives. And I think Mandy, you and I were just kind of, you, you kind of just challenged and talked about that. Um, it's a huge component of it. Like you set goals and define measures, and then you actually have to design and develop programs that, which are actionable. You're actually gonna do something to help you get there. And then you monitor the performance toward those goals to determine if they're met. There is a difference between having health equity measures and having diversity, equity, and inclusion measures. They are distinct, um, distinctly different. Um, and you know, there's just some some examples here, like measures related to DEI, uh, numbers or proportions of populations represented in key areas, activities, or functions, environmental assessments, like. Um, do you have, is your environment uh, ADA accessible? Does your environment uh, provide a warm and welcoming environment to certain subpopulations? You know, will a person who identifies as uh, LGBT, a member of the LGBTQ plus community feel warm and welcomed uh, in your environment? Is your environment, uh, if you provide adolescent health services in a pediatric clinic, do they come in and feel welcome or do they feel like a child? You know, those are the type of environmental assessments that um, can be done from a DEI perspective. Um, and then understanding the perceptions and experience of populations in key areas, activities, and functions. Those are DEI. Measures related to health equity, you're actually looking for differential outcomes. Um, in the services that you provide. So healthcare access, patient outcomes, healthcare quality. So you're actually measuring the outcomes of the service for the health services that you offer. So some DEI accountability examples, let you know, we talked about the governing board. So you're putting new members on your governing board. What percentage of new governing board members will be members of racially and ethnically minoritized populations? You're hiring new people. Um, how many of them have a self-identified physical, intellectual, or developmental disability? Like those are DEI types of measures for diversity. If you were talking about equity, you would be more specific, like for the new employees that are being hired, you wouldn't talk about the organization as a whole. You would be saying, but or, let's look at every level in the organization because you could easily hire new people in the organization with a physical, intellectual, or developmental disability and put them all in environmental services or you know nutrition services. But are you being intentional to hire them and give them opportunity at every level in the organization? So are they in your C-suite? Are they in your managerial positions? Are they in your non-managerial positions, right? Like how are you creating opportunity at every level of the organization if you're being equity focused? And then when you talk about inclusion, are they actually satisfied in the workplace, right? So do you, are they, do, when you look at job satisfaction, did you do more than hire them? Do they actually have a valuable and respected experience in the workplace? And there's a number of metrics that go into job satisfaction. So this would be a combined score, a composite score that helps you get there. And inclusion, again, when you're looking at the experience of the patients that you have in your environment, your services, you can do that. So diversity, equity, and inclusion, we often talk about them as a combined um, aspect, but inclusion is the pinnacle. Like you've done more than just brought them into your workplace. You've actually created an environment where people feel welcome, respected, dignity exists, all of those things. When you're talking about health equity measures, you are actually looking at things related to health outcomes and you don't have differential outcomes related to those things. So you have to start being a little bit more discriminant and discreet and you're looking at 
the specifics around health indicators. So you got to start getting granular. You're talking about the actual health services that you offered. I've just thrown some up here, very specific to cancer care um, it, because you all are cancer centers. And they could be related to the health services themselves or they can be related to the process. So I've given some related to breast cancer, but I also put up, you know, pancreatic cancer vaccine trials, right? Clinical participation in the cancer trial. And looking at that by race, ethnicity, gender identity, primary language spoken at home, looking at all of those different types of demographic and social factors that help to ultimately, like if we're not getting them into the cancer vaccine trial, how will we know that the vaccine is going to be effective in certain subpopulations or that we're giving equitable access to the trial to the specific populations who may be disproportionately impacted by um, by uh, this type of cancer. So does that make sense while we're distinguishing between the health equity measures and the diversity equity and inclusion measures? And it's important to know that at, you know, as you were doing this work in your cancer centers, um, that you may have to do these in parallel, right? So you may have one audience that's more interested in the health equity measures and one audience that's more interested in the DEI measures but both of them will help to advance health equity outcomes, okay? So a mature organization that's advancing, that's improving health outcomes and achieving health equity for everybody will be, will be moving these, these types of measures in parallel. Um, when it comes to talking about communicating these things, you'll see that the, that the depiction of the, the structure now looks like a shared pot, right? Before it was like this tripartite structure. And that's because there has to be a uniformity of message. So the governing board, the executive leadership, advisory board, they now have to all be on the same page. They have a shared responsibility for communicating. The, go the executive internal leadership is often communicating this same message to all of the staff that they have the daily responsibility for overseeing and managing. They often communicate these messages to patients either through direct communication, signage, service delivery, all of these things to them. And the governing board often will communicate similarly to the staff and the patients, depending on the amount of touches that they have with them. There then becomes some overlap between how the executive leadership, the governing board, the advisory board then begins to communicate with community partners, coalition members, clinical partners, business partners and vendors, research partners, academic collaborators, funders, donors. You should not be doing business and engaging in partnerships who don't have the same DEI values, health equity values and missions, right? And then your business partners and vendors, you can be advancing your DEI goals through these business, business partners and vendors, right? Choosing to advance equity principles and inclusion principles by partnering with minority owned businesses, Etc. So there's a lot of ways that these shared responsibilities and single messaging can be communicated to those stakeholders. You can create systems of public accountability, being very clear about what your health equity goals and your DEI goals and values are, how you will take action if you don't meet those goals and values. So it's not that you keep them a secret and then once you meet them, you tell everybody, right? <laughs> but you actually are transparent around them and you create systems of accountability. If we miss them, then we're gonna implement X, Y, Z processes in place. And then once you meet those goals, just don't leave them the same. You know, if you create a three to five year plan, don't keep those same goals for 10, 15 years because then you create stagnation. You're not challenging yourself to be better. There's a lot of work to be done to, to eliminate differential outcomes, right? There's a lot of work to be done to advance DEI. So keep creating challenge goals. And then continue engagement beyond executive leadership and goal setting. So some of you act like, depending on where I sit in the organization, how do I create influence? If you're in executive leadership or middle management, Keep thinking about ways to, to engage people at various levels. I used to tell people all the time, all of the great ideas in this organization don't sit around the, the executive leadership table meeting every Wednesday. We have to be walking around the organization, talking to people, getting input and ideas. There's annual meetings, then there's town halls, then there's drop things in the box, then there's random sending of emails. There's constant ways to be getting feedback from people who are more likely to be directly engaged with clients on an ongoing basis. 
So there's lots of ways, again, to be thinking about how to be creative, how to keep getting inputs um, and to make all of these things. You know, the goal is just to keep people healthy. Um, and the goal is to make sure that you're delivering great services to people when they need us and when they're not healthy uh, and to improve the quality and experience of life for folks. So that's it for me. I hope this has been insightful and helpful and that you all are still awake. <laughs> Thank you hour. so much. This was super helpful. Um